Today, as I'm standing in the threshold of what used to be our old sanctuary and our old foyer, I'm just so amazed by all God has done for Radiant Church in the last six years. I'm recounting the miracles of what got us to where we are today. And I'm just so amazed I want to retell this story. And I think about it and I, it just seems like miraculous to me. Our first miracle was that God would birth this church. That was our first prayer. We began meeting in our living room as we moved into Jackson in 2013. And we were praying, God, would you birth a church? Would you birth a life-giving church? But we had one big issue is we had limited people and, and, and no place to meet. And so our second miracle was this very building. This building we seen online, we felt like we got a word from the Lord that he was gonna give it to us. But when we approached the church, they literally chuckled and laughed and said it would take a miracle because they already had a buyer and they had a, a second buyer in place who was offering a full price cash and it would be a miracle for us to get it. Because we had no people, no money, and we weren't even a church yet. But the other two things fell through and God miraculously gave us this building. So we set out and within six weeks, we flipped this church. We ripped up old carpet, painted walls, took out pews, put chairs in, put up a PA system so that by March 2nd, 2014, we held our first service, our official service and 120 people showed up and we were so excited. And we thought if half of those people come, I mean, if 60 people are here next week, we got something and 100 people showed up the following week. And all year through 2014, we continued to grow. We grew to about 180 people. And over four years, by 2018, we were nearly 500 people and outgrowing this space. And so we had to believe God for another miracle. And I've been asked, like, why has God allowed Radiant Church to grow so rapidly? And when I think about it, here's what I believe. From day one, we've set out to be a praying and worshiping church. We wanna create environments for people to encounter the presence of God. And because we've decided to do that, I think that's one of the main things. We value loving people. All of those things, preaching the word of God with truth and grace, I believe all of those things set us up for the divine appointment of where we are today. Because of how quickly we were growing as a church, we started experiencing these stress points. One is our children's ministry. We were outgrowing that space. Our foyer became crowded. When we would gather in the sanctuary, there was no room. I mean, we were packing every place. Parking was limited. We were just feeling the stress points in every area. So we started doing analysis, like how long can we meet in this space? This 7,000 square foot facility, is it gonna be enough for us in the future? So the analysis came back that no, it wouldn't be enough. That by the fall of 2018, that we would be out of room for growth. And we just knew that that couldn't be the solution. That couldn't, we can't stop here. We have to, we have to keep making room for people. So we started seeking the Lord, like, Lord, what's the future for Radiant Church? Is it this location? Is it another location? Is it multiple locations? Like, what do you want? So the leadership, the elders, we began praying. And the Lord gave us a plan and he gave us a word. And the word was Isaiah 54, three. The Lord said, we, we weren't done here yet. And, and Isaiah says, enlarge the place of your gathering, enlarge your tent, strengthen your stakes, lengthen your cords, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. God was revealing to us that we were still gonna be here and we had to grow. So we went to the church on our anniversary of March of 2018 and we shared the vision of this building. We asked you to pray about going on a 24 month spiritual journey to make this building become a reality. And then we came together as a church and we made a commitment over 24 months. So by September of 2018, we broke ground. And over the next 10 months, we're moving dirt, we're moving asphalt, we're putting up steel, we're putting up drywall, we are painting, we are having parties where we're all coming together to do the work to make it ready for our first service. And within 10 months, by July of 2019, we held our first worship service in our new facility. And over 700 people showed up to celebrate that day with us. So here we are on our six year anniversary anticipating what's still to come.
as I recall the last 24 months of our spiritual journey together, as I'm looking back at the last six years of our church, as I'm standing in this brand new foyer space, as I'm looking at the pictures on the walls throughout the building, I'm just so amazed at all God has done. I could have never anticipated. I don't think any of us could have anticipated all that God has done. Over these six years, we've watched hundreds of people respond to salvation. Over a hundred people getting baptized. We're watching marriages becoming renewed and strengthened. People are discovering freedom and identity. Lives are being transformed. Needs are being met in our community. Hundreds of people are going through these doors and worshiping Jesus. We are seeing God move, and I believe we're in the middle of a revival. And as I'm thinking about this, I know that physically we built a 12,000 square foot facility. But spiritually, we made room for more people who were far from Jesus. We're not done yet. There's more lives that need to be changed. There's more people who need to be reached. There's prodigal sons and daughters who are still looking for a home, still looking for a place. There are orphans' hearts that need to find their home in Jesus. Like all of these things are things that we were believing that God is still going to do in our city. I believe Radiant Church is going to be a catalyst for revival. I believe revival is coming to Jackson. And I want to say thank you for joining us, whether you've just become part of the Radiant family or you've been here from the beginning or anywhere in between. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for saying yes to God. Thank you for trusting us to be a part of your life and joining the vision of this church. And together, as we pray, as we seek God, as we're diving into his heart, I believe we're going to continue to advance the kingdom of God in our own city. And I thank you for joining the vision. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for saying yes. Let's move forward because greater things are yet to come. Yeah, God was awesome. Uh, did want to just play that for you, but I'm a little embarrassed now since Pastor Lee was like, don't have numbers for success. <laughs> but in all fairness, it's pre-COVID. It was it counted then. It counted. Uh, I just want to quickly just share our um, um, story and journey. And I, I, I see a couple of us have walked in um, maybe during the video. So at the end, we, we want to give you all of our resources that we did for our building project, all of our promotion materials, all of our teaching materials, every one of our leadership meetings, all of our emails, all of that we're going to give to you. We'll put it back up at the end. But I just want to share 11 steps. So this is super practical. This is not a, a teaching or anything, but I'm going to share our steps. I kind of thought through like, oh, how would this help people? And our steps of our building project, which ended up being over 24 months. So when we were growing and we were in that 7,000 square foot space, if we had 100 people in the room, it was feeling you know, really full. So we, we started asking the question, and here's step number one. You have to an answer this question. Why is it important to build? And we prayed about it. Like We didn't know if that was the right solution, actually. We thought, do we need another location or multiple locations? The reason why you want to answer this question, because it's going to help you clarify your vision to move forward, you have to know why are we going to build. Um, for us, it was simple. We're just running out of room. Like, uh, by the time we were doing this analysis in early 2017, it came back, said we were averaging a 25, depending on the year, between 20 and 30 percent growth, which we knew, wow, by 2018, we're just we're not going to be able to sustain this. Even adding services would be unsustainable with the size of staff we had. So we knew this is this is the answer to our question of the why it was because we we're going to run out of space. 
So uh, the way you can apply this, and here's what you want to do, is you want to answer these questions. Why must we do this? What happens if we don't do this? Um, and, and the thing I start asking, like, what would it mean for my city if, if, we, didn't, if we just stopped the growth? Because we could have just said, no, we like this. Let's just, you know, cap it here. We felt like that's a bad idea. Um, number two, uh, for your spiritual journey, for us, we, we wanted to determine all of the things that were hindering us. This is key. It may not sound like a key thing to know, but determine every limitation that's hindering growth for you. And you've seen me kind of spell it out in the video that you just watched. This, when you answer that question, um, you're, answer, you're, you're, you're answering this question. If we build, what problems does that fix? Because it's not enough to just go to the congregation and say, we got a vision where we need to build. They're going to ask, especially financial leaders, they're going to like, why do you need to build? And have you thought through these things? So um, you have to know your stress points. So I'm going to tell you what ours were. Uh, when we had a full Sunday like Easter or something like at the movies, we literally ran out of parking space. The, our facilities is on three acres. We were parking people in the grass. We were parking people in our neighbor's parking lot without asking them. And we were just running out of a room. So we would literally be parking all, all different properties. So that was one. Our children's hallways were narrow uh, and overcrowded. That was a stress point. Like if you had to pick your kids up in kids ministry in our church, it was a four-foot hallway, and every room was packed. That was a stress point. We had three identical services. We were filling all of them, except for, you know, that noon service. But uh, one and two was getting full. That was a stress point. There was no room in the foyer. Uh, so that was a stress point. So this is what we would share with people. We, would, we determined to fix all of these stresses. Like, we need to build a 12,000-square-foot facility so that we can have a, a large foyer. And I would tell our church, like, look, the foyer is where ministry is happening. That's where you're having conversations. That's where discipleship, that's where you're encouraging one another. Ministry is taking place in the foyer. So I would sell all of that. Like, I just would celebrate all of those things as the answer to the problems we were facing because they were real problems. Our, our foyer, we didn't even have air conditioning, and it was just so hot. So number three, so step one, why is it important to build? Step two, you have to know your current limitations that's hindering your growth. That's what you need to share because it answers the question for your congregation. Number three, you have to create a plan that resolves that tension. You create a, a plan that resolves those limitations. And that's easy, right? Well, it's not easy. You need a system and you need a plan. You need a system to deliver that plan. So our plan, I'm just going to bullet point these for you, is this. We hired an architect who help us look at our property space, our, our, our current facility, and how to add to that. We, we did this with the board. We did this with key leaders. Um, we determined and anticipated cost, which was way off. <laughs> we thought we'd build for $1.8 million. We ended up spending $2.8 million. So really far off. It was that whole time when they started putting tariffs on steel. Uh, and I was like, oh, what's happening that this is way out of whack? So we, you have to determine your cost. Then you're going to need to develop a campaign. I didn't like the word campaign, so I, I used the word building initiative. So we developed a building initiative. We called it Making Room. Uh, we used that verse from Isaiah 54.3, uh, uh, stretch out your tent pegs. Uh, that's what we used for that. And then we started drafting our blueprints, designing logos, gearing up for this um, building initiative. And then we created a presentation for the church um, to share. So that's number three. Number four, you want to develop a proper timeline for your building initiative. So determine your length that you want for a campaign. Most campaigns are probably around three years. We, we chose 24 months, although we, we followed through for three years. So we did two years, it was over, but people continued to give to the campaign well into a year, which is why, uh, which is why we, we were able to go over our, our, our initial commitments. So determine the length of your campaign. Ours was 24 months. Uh, the first month, we met with key leaders to share the vision. So we didn't tell the church yet. We met with key leaders and we started sharing vision with um, uh, our elders, our key leaders. And then we set a date 
uh, for our leadership dinner. So our plan was like, let's meet with leaders. Let's, let's uh, plan dinners with key leaders, with financial leaders. And I know that may be a weird thing. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But we determined all the key dates. What's going to be a public launch? And we timed all that out. We wanted all our leaders to know before we ever told, told the church publicly. And we wanted all of our um, financial leaders to know before we launched publicly so that we could answer their questions. Number five. Oh, we're doing great. I'm ripping through these. Number five, we begin to meet with the banks and the builders. So number five is really blurry of where that is in the transition because it can be anywhere in there. But uh, the time to meet with the bank is not on the front end of the campaign. In fact, we had met with the bank probably a year before we started when we had that first analysis, I approached the bank and they said, hey, go see this pastor. He's in the middle of a building project. And I went and seen him and he was the one that gave us the idea, gave us um, the, the network that we went through or the, the um, organization Enjoy Solutions helped us with our launch and helped us with our process. So we were meeting with all of them even before. So on the front end, I would go to the banks and say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're planning. Have some type of architectural rendition so you can show that uh, because the banks for us was the hardest piece. Of course, that would be. We went to the banks in like 2016, 2017, and when we had our commitments, and I took it to our, our bank in 2018, so this was spring of 2018, I shared with them like, hey, we've, re, we're, we've raised, uh, we have commitments to $530,000, I think we had maybe three hundred or 400000 of it at the time, and they said, yeah, that's nowhere close, and we're not, we're not going to help you, you need, you need to find someone else. So we were looking at all kinds of different organizations, nonprofits that help churches kind of get their vision. We looked at the Wesleyan, um, I can't remember the name, do you remember the name of them? Yeah, yeah, we, we talked with those guys, and we were, we were inspired by them. We, we talked with Assemblies of God. We were, we were inspired by them, and they all said, yeah, we can help you do it. But when it got down to it, they wanted a lot more down than we were able to. So it was July of 2018, and uh, our original bank here in, in the area had said, we need, you need this amount. You're not close. We're not going to be able to help you. So we went to all of those nonprofits that helped churches, you know, realize that vision. We got there, and they, they wanted um, more than we were able to put in. And so I called up the bank in, in July, and I had uh, another organization that was ready to help us, but we, I just couldn't get there. So I called them. I said, hey, I'm discouraged because, you know, you guys said you could help us. Now you're saying you're not. I said, here's where we are, and we, I think we had gotten up to like 500000 and he said, Pastor Mike, you need about 650000 for us to finance you, which at the time was, I think, two point, we were over the two point million mark, so I, uh, I said, look, our giving is strong, here's where our commitments are landing, and I was sharing all the numbers, and I said to him, I said, uh, his name was Nick, I said, Nick, uh, what do you need, and he, he told me the number, I said, well, I'm 125000 off of that. I said, we need to break ground or we're gonna, it's going to hurt us. If we don't break ground, we're going to stop growing. It's going to hurt us. And he says, well, that's what you need. And I don't know why it came out of my mouth, but I just said, hey, would you loan us that difference? And he just said, yeah. And I'm like, what? Wait, you're telling me you need... So he said, yeah, we'll just loan you the difference and you put all your commitments to make that happen and we got funded. And so I was like... <laughs> Man, I had pulling my hair out for eight weeks, calling all of these guys, and, uh, and I didn't know you could do that, but I just thought I'd ask the question, like, well, will you just give me the difference, and I'll give it back, and it, which to me is the same thing as just giving it all to me anyway, but for whatever reason, it was different in his mind, so we made it happen, so somewhere in there, I would say you're going to meet with the banks, you know, if you're already thinking of building, you probably are already doing that, because you're going to want to know what are you expecting you're going to want to know. Um, so for us, we needed, for the bank we went with, needed to put 20% down. Most of our conversations were around 30%. And that, that was the rub for us. We couldn't make that 30% happen and build. Number six, uh, do you want to develop and unite your leadership? So you're going to develop new leaders in the midst of your uh, front end of your campaign. And you're going to unite your, your current leadership. And you're going to build teams and all of this. So we started rec recruiting team members for our campaign or for our building initiative. I'll tell you what these teams were. We had a design team. 
uh, that started designing all of our, our print and our logo. This was, um, we actually hired someone here from the church. Our, I didn't have someone on our staff yet that was worked in design. So uh, one of the staff members here in Kalamazoo did this for us and designed this for us. So we had a design team and, and part of that, their responsibility was handling all the print because we were printing all of this stuff. And we had an event team because we were going to have, I think, two leadership. We had uh, two leadership dinners and we had multiple leadership meetings before we went public. Uh, And then we had a ton of of private meetings with financial leaders. We had a follow up team. I'm going to get to that follow-up in in a little bit. The follow-up team is really key. And then we also had a coordinator that just kind of touched base with all these teams. So we started meeting meeting with them. Uh, Let me talk about key donors. And I know uh, I'm a pastor. I'm not good at uh, asking, you know, going one-on-one. I know some guys are great at this. I'm not. Uh, Going one-on-one and just sharing Hey, here's the vision. You're a financial leader. So we, what we called a financial leader in our church was anyone who gave $5,000 and above. And I didn't know this. We, we hired an outside company that, that took all of our data and, and said, here's your key leaders. 10000 anyone $10,000 and above, I met with them. And I know this is probably not kosher to say, but I'm just sharing this is what I did. And I told them, like, I don't feel comfortable doing this. They said, you know, you need to meet with all your financial leaders. You need to sit them down. And, you know, Romans 12, I believe it's Romans 12, it literally says generosity is one of the gifts. So uh, they said, no, you need to meet with them. This, now this is incredible because he, these, anyone 10,000 above was a, a personal dinner that I went out with. And we didn't have a lot of those. We were, so it was like maybe five people. Uh, but I went out to dinner. But the, what was crazy was one of this couple had been in our church for several, several years. And I really don't look at people's giving, so I didn't know this. But I'd learned this couple's name who was a key donor to our church. And so I took them out. And I apologized. I said, I didn't realize, you know, that you, you were a financial leader in our church. I never really used that term. And and I'm not a salesman, but I just started, you know, just sharing with them. And I shared with the vision. Well, I asked him, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a builder. And I'm like, oh. And so we're, we're talking. And, and uh, he had built, like, neighborhoods in our community. He had built um, plazas in, in our community. Like, he was a legit builder. So in my mind, I'm thinking, is this my builder? And so I jump in the car at the end of dinner. And I'm wife and I said what if that guy builds our church and so we are meeting with all these builders uh, who were giving us uh, quotes or what they would charge to build and uh, the one day before he comes up to me in church his name was Dan and Dan said hey um, I'd like to help with a building project and I said have you ever built a steel building he said no I've never built a steel building but I'm telling you I could do it so I said oh um, well, tomorrow's when we're meeting with all the builders. Can you have something? He said, well, I really need about two weeks, but yes, I'll, do, I'll have it by tomorrow. So he showed up. We have the board there, the board's there, the architect's there, and we're meeting with all these builders. And Dan, he comes in and he lays it down, and this guy in our church ends up being our builder. And that was because I met with key donors. So he, we were able to build um, at, a, you know, at a discount that we wouldn't have got without that so what I did with these key donors is I just um, shared with them the reason why I did it is because they do have the gift of generosity and because they're financial leaders they have questions that other people aren't going to ask so I would sit them down and then when we developed our presentation and I want to show that to you I thought I had it here I do right here I had this in an iPad format but this book that's what we gave the church and I I walked them through our, you know, the front of this is here's what we've done, here's what we've accomplished, here's how many people that have gotten saved and baptized. And I'm sharing with them, like, all of this is how, here's our, the things that we've done over the past four years that's caused us to grow, and your generosity has made this possible. Um, before I shared this on my iPad, I'd ask them, what is it that you love about Radiant Church? And I would remember, like, what they said. Some of them would be, you know, our kids, and they would say something that happened in kids' ministry with their kids, or, or they would say maybe something that happened with their prayer partner or, or during worship. You know, I just encountered God during worship. And I would remember over dinner what they were telling me. So then when I pulled this out at the end of dinner, I would connect wherever in this brochure that they had mentioned 
I would say, see this kids thing. We're out of space. You said you love the kids ministry because of what it done for your daughter. Like, we need to make room. And, like, they would start weeping. And, I, and because I feel awkward, like, like, I'm just awkward that way. Like, I've never asked people for money. I've never been through a building project where I had to, I mean, we had here in Kalamazoo, but Lee did all that. I didn't have to do any of this. So I'd, I'd call him, like, how do you do this? And he's like, yeah, we're not good at this. We're, you're meant for the platform, not for the, this. But I would start sh- sharing with him, like, you know, when that greeter uh, met me in the foyer, that, that was why we decided to stay. Then I'd talk about the foyer space. And somehow it, like, just connected with her heart, like, the foyer sold it. Amazing. So this brochure, and this is in that, that folder, we get, in one of the folders we gave you, I would just walk them through this and just connect them to that vision. So uh, you want to meet with your financial leaders, and anyone who was under that 10,000 mark, we held just gatherings of maybe 10 uh, to 15 people, and what I did is I put them on the, I put all their chairs on the stage. They didn't know I was going to do this. Uh, but we put the tables on, on the stage in that little foyer or in that little sanctuary that we had in the Baptist box church. And we had hors d'oeuvres or something, snacks, cheesecake, things like that. And I'm doing the same thing, just having conversation. It's very conversational. I'm, I'm not selling anything. I'm not trying to share a vision. But as they're talking, I'm remembering what these 12 people are saying to me. And then I do go through a video presentation and connecting. So when Jenny said this, or when Bob said this, uh, I would just share that vision with them. But at the end of all of it, I would say, what are your questions? Because anyone who's going to, they trust you. They're giving to your, you know, your church. I want all of my leaders uh, and and my financial leaders, because that's a real thing in church. You have financial leaders in your church, and they're asking questions that probably the average giver isn't. And I wanted all of their questions answered. Um, and it was never the one main question that always got asked, which is, I don't understand it. But we had this massive, massive oak tree in our front yard, probably, it, maybe this big around. It was probably 100 years old. And just about every time someone say, what's going to happen to the oak tree? I'm like, that's what you want to know? What's going to happen to the oak tree? So uh, we ended up taking it down, broke a lot of hearts. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, got to make room. We did try to keep it. I told Dan, the builder, Dan, the builder, I said, Dan, you got to figure out a way to keep that oak tree, man. People are loving that oak tree. There, there were some legitimate questions, but that seemed to be like the main one. Then, so what I did, so I met with all of our financial leaders and I developed other leaders. The, during, this, during this whole process, this is my daughter-in-law in the back. She's running graphics. Her name's Grace. Uh, she was, she's who we put over our design and creative team to like oversee that, and she killed it. And I'm like, I don't know. This is not nepotism, but I am hiring that girl. And, uh, and so we did. But I wouldn't have known that if we hadn't gone. Like this building project helped me discover leaders that I didn't know were in the church as I started assigning all of these things and so I think if you do have a building project don't just look at your like your staff like who in the congregation uh can we pull into this she did an incredible job and uh actually there's a couple people we ended up bringing on staff as a result of uh, a building initiative and when we're building I'm not thinking staff members it wasn't my uh, you know my process wasn't thinking that way but I discovered it so develop leaders and unite your current leadership then we would host, then we hosted a leadership launch. That's number seven. We hosted a leadership launch. And what that was, was uh, not just financial leaders and key leaders, but this was anybody who led anything. So if you're leading a community group, if you're leading in kids ministry somewhere, if you are leading the parking lot team, we want to tell you about this vision. So we brought them in and we shared the vision again. By this time, I'm getting good at it. I'm feeling bad. I'm repenting. Lord, I feel like a salesman, but i um, getting smoother at this. And, um, and again, I'm asking that this dinner, that I'm, uh, I'm answering all their questions at the end. This one I had a presentation for. I like shared... Um, uh, I'll share something shameless I did. Uh, I'm not ashamed of it because it got the point across. 
I was just asking, like, hey, what do you think you spend in, 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 on your kids' equipment for sports? I was talking about, and everyone's like, well, what's your sport? Oh, my kids in football, my kids in baseball or soccer. And I said, what do you feel like you spend on them? And they're all talking at the tables because it was a big dinner, and everyone's jotting down their numbers. And I said, hey, write it down. I, I want to hear what you guys are giving to that. And so they're all shouting out, like, $1,000. And I, and I said, hey, how much have you invested into kingdom work? to save your children because at the end of the day the coach is not the one they're going to go to when they're 24 years old and having and, and having a crisis in their life and a pin dropped in the room and uh i felt like it was like a god idea to get the point across and it did and we we had our leaders make the first commitment i'm telling them at this dinner i said in a month from now we're going to tell the whole church about this and we want the leaders uh to go first, and we want to demonstrate that to our congregation. I'm asking you to pray about this over the next couple of weeks. So I asked them for their help. I said, hey, guys, um, most of you, you're in the room because you're a leader, so you get the vision. There, and there's some here in our church that uh, they'll be a part of it, but they won't get the vision, and I'm going to need your help to pass it on to them. So I asked them for their help to help people catch the vision, pass on the vision. People that might not, you know, I've learned this. If, if you're a pastor, you understand this. People don't tell their pastor what he needs to know. They, they tell him what he wants to hear. So uh, what I learned was to pass that down to my leaders and say, help me pass this vision on. Because they're going to be, they're going to ask you the questions. So I spent probably 30 minutes just answering every question in the room. Just, what's your question? Because I wanted them um, to have all the questions answered so they could help me answer the other questions. I gave them that night all the key dates. I gave them our public launch. I gave them uh, the, when they were going to have a commitment. Uh, I, talk, I talked to them about our teaching series. I let them know everything I was going to do. I was as transparent as I could be. Uh, I did that. So that was number seven. Number eight, we had a, you know, everyone knows that this is coming, but we planned a big public launch. Uh, and for us, uh, this isn't something I came up with, it's, it's Enjoy. Enjoy Solutions is the organization that we hired to help us. Um, if you are going to do a building project, I would recommend hiring an organization that does this. And the reason why, for me, I, it was, uh, we had done it here, we had two building projects here. We did one with an organization that helped us, I think round two, we did it ourselves because we had one. But for me, because I was new, I was like, this is way too important to just try to shoot from the hip. And so I wasn't going to shoot from the hip on it, they helped me, but he's, they are the ones that helped me understand, like, this big public launch, this big day that you're going to let everybody know about the vision, you want people to remember this day. And the, the thing they said to me was, it, like Easter, like Easter. So we, we used a tent as kind of the picture that we would use for this. And uh, making room, stretch out your tent pegs, lengthen your cords. Isaiah 54 is what we just pushed through this whole thing and kept preaching from the pulpit. So we bought this big old army tent that we thought we were going to put up in the church, but realized it smelled like an old musty army tent. So I'm like, that's not going up in my building. We're going to put that out in the yard. But So we had that out in the yard, this massive tent that you know kids loved and went and played in, and we had balloons everywhere. Uh, and people remembered that day, still talk about it. On Commitment Sunday, we had um, uh, people come up and, and sign a piece of the, the, the building that was going to go up. Like they all signed. I said, uh, put your name down, put someone's name down. You're believing God to, to come in over the next couple of years. And they would, on the Commitment Sunday, they wrote it. We had already had a piece of that building that was going to be erected. And they brought that in. And it was eight feet. You know, it was massive. And they, they filled it. And today, it's a, that is above our threshold. You can't see it because it's you know, painted now and, and drywalled over. But that sits there. And that people remember that. So you want people to remember this day. Uh, also on that day, we shared with our church what our leadership had already committed to and what we had already raised. So that inspires people. Number nine. So our public launch w was a, we're telling people here's what we're doing. Then we did a teaching series. I did a four-week um, uh, teaching series. 
And I told the church, hey, we're going to go on a, a spiritual journey together. I really did believe this was going to be a spiritual landmark. This, this is in that folder that um, we gave you guys that has all of our resources. We printed out a 21-day spiritual journey. And we just said, hey, uh, as a church, we're, over the next 21 days, we're going to ask God what our part is. And I taught a teaching series. I taught on sacrifice. I taught on generosity. I taught on making room for other people. Um, and here's why I did this um, stewardship series. It, to me, it wasn't really about money. Like I was emphasizing that everything is God's and helping people connect with what matters most and the sacrifice that we made and that I really wanted a spirit of partnership. And so I was often sharing with the congregation over four weeks, like, hey, a sacrifice is willing to give up what you love for something you love even more. That's what a sacrifice, willing to give up something you love for something. And I would emphasize that over the four weeks so that people knew, like, yeah, I want that boat or I want that motorcycle and I love that, but I love the church and I want my family saved. I want my friends saved and uh, I'm willing to sacrifice for a couple. I'm willing to sacrifice that vacation to um, make this dream and make this vision a reality so that we can reach our community because I love that more. I love the vision of Jesus more. Uh, Number 10. I would say this number 10 is the key thing. The literal key thing that helped us maintain our commitments and even go beyond it. So some of you jumped in the room late. We, we were told we could raise on the top end 380000 of commitments. And anyone who's been through a building project, you've heard the, the horror stories. like count on half of that. So that was scaring me. Uh, what ended up being committed was 530000 So I'm like, okay, we're going to get 250000 over the next two years. We actually ended up at almost 10000 shy of 700000 So this is how we did it, is number 10. We kept the vision before the people. Because usually what happens in building initiatives, you get all excited, you share the literature, you're giving all the pamphlets out, you're giving out commitment cards, and... Um, you're giving out commitment cards, and then you get all the commitments, and you're excited. You're talking with banks, and then you stop talking about it. And that's where there is no vision. People cast off restraint. And I would say it uh, this way. If you don't keep the vision before people, they just cast off restraint. They forget that you're doing this, or they think the need's already there. Or the bank's already provided. What do you need? So every first Sunday of the month, I mean religiously, every first Sunday of the month, I was celebrating something about this campaign. It was coming up every single Sunday. Um, This is, if you're going to build, if you're going to go through a commitment, if you're going to have a 24 to 36 month commitment, this is the key thing that's going to help people remember the vision. And some of the times I would show where we were at. Like I'd have a pie chart of like, this is what we were committed. This much came in. Some of us are here. Some of us. And what I was doing was helping them see where they were at on that pie chart. Um, So uh, the first month I did this, I would celebrate every single win. Every single win I would celebrate. I mean, if uh, dirt got moved, I was, I said, did you see someone move dirt? And they're like, yes. And it seemed like for nine months, all we seen was hill, dirt hills just move. And I would get so afraid. Did you see this hills over here now? And like, like, come on, somebody, dirt's moving. And people would start, uh, you know, getting happy. <laughs> they get happy about it. Um, so, and I did that literally for two years. So 24 times I kept talking about it. When, when the township approved something, I bring that paper. I'm like, look at this, the township approved, whatever. And uh, they're like, yes, it's going to happen. And um, we did have some battles through all of that, which I don't have time to share. But one of them I want to share with you because it was really discouraging. Um, and I, don't, and I want to leave you discouraged. <laughs> I went through i uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We... When we started breaking ground and we started meeting with the township, we had three property owners behind us, three neighbors behind us who we shared a boundary line with. There was a neighborhood behind our church. And 
they thought was their property was ours. So here we are, we got, you know, steel coming in and things happening, and we get a call from an attorney that's asking us to cease our project. And I'm just like, what? And they're like, um, I'd learned a word. I'm sure I've heard it before, but I must have forgot about it. My reticular activating system didn't pull it up. But it was a word called acquiescence. And it's a real estate word, which if, if I've been using this property for um, another uh, layman's term, squatter's rights, I've been using your property. I've been using your property for, you know, how many ever years, which 15 in Michigan, uh, if you wanted to know. Uh, it, then it becomes ours. So they're taking us to court. And my attorney and, and the Radiant Network here, hey, this is a reason why you want to be in a network. They have connections that help you. So I'm reaching out to the, the network here, and I'm like, I need an attorney. I don't know what to do. And they helped me find somebody and a real estate guy strong in, in, the, you know, in Michigan. And he said, uh, we were getting ready to cut those trees down. He said, do not cut a tree down. He said, if you start cutting trees and you lose then you're in trouble and paying a lot. So uh, we uh, ended up getting all of the attorneys together, getting, you know, we were in different rooms, and we started negotiating this thing out. And uh, I had to sign a disclosure, so I can't really share, like, what. But basically, I said, how long is it going to take if we go to court? Because we, we couldn't build. Here's the kind of the, the double bind we were in. They wanted the property, but we had to have so many parking spots by the townships. Um, ordinances to build and if we gave them that property we couldn't build because we wouldn't have enough parking space so we're literally calling an engineer the engineer on this at while we're all you know at this attorney's office and like how much property can I give these people without uh, without sacrificing these parking spots and it was basically like 10 feet and so I asked my attorney, how long is it going to take, like, how long will we be slowed down? He said, about a year. If you go to court, you're done for a year. I'm like, I can't wait a year. So I just gave them, I can't share what it is for disclosure reasons, but I gave them a very strong number and said, well, I'll give you 10 feet and I will pay you to take the 10 feet uh, if you, you know, if we don't go to court. And if you don't take it, we got to go to court because at the end of the day, I won't be able to build if you want more than this. Uh, and let me just say, it's a number that made me sick to my stomach, but they took the money. So, you know, Ecclesiastes does say money answers all things, and I learned that it did. Uh, <laughs> but it was a miracle for us. Ended up being a miracle. And what, how I ended, came to that is I was praying one day, and it was, I'd never remember reading this in Hebrews before. But in the back of Hebrews, it says, you gladly, you, uh, when they confiscated your property, you were glad about it or something like that. And I'm like, that's in the Bible, and that like, uh, and the Lord is telling. And I took it was a word from the Lord for me. It happened to be my like what? Okay, all right, let's give it to him. And that was how I ended up with that solution, and it and it did work. Uh, I share that story, but it was not one of the wins I celebrated. Uh, I did want to say it, but I couldn't. Um, and then uh, and the last one. So one year into our project, um, halfway through. We did another teaching series on stewardship. So in year one, this was our commitment card. I just want to share, share this with you. Um, and this is like, hey, what can you commit to over the next 12 or 24 months as a church to help us make this vision a reality? And this is what we did in year one. So at the very beginning of it. So 12 months later, real clever, we just changed the color. But I did this teaching series, and here's what I did. Uh, and I think the church appreciated this because we had new people that came over that last year. So what are their on-ramps? Like, how do I get them involved? So I did it again. I did another stewardship series, basically the same one. It's, it is a little different, but you got both of them. If you get download that folder, you have both of those teaching series. And, but this time on this one, I released people who I said, maybe you committed a year ago and something changed, like you lost your job or... Um, or, you know, your income shifted. I, I probably didn't say lost your job, but your income shifted. Or uh, We want to release you from your commitment. 
Like, so, and that happened. Like, some people turned in cards and said, I'm not able to do it. We thank them. Like, man, we're just so blessed what you did do. Uh, and then, but other people who were new to the church, we, we gave them opportunity to give over the next, over the last 12 months, and, and we did. So it gave new people an on-ramp, and it released others who weren't able to follow through, because I didn't want, that wasn't my heart. It's like, look, if you can, I'm not going to be, we're not going to be the church that's calling you. And it's like, hey, you didn't you miss your commitment. Uh, we just said, hey, if you can, we, we understand. So that was our journey. That's the steps that we took. I mean, there's, it's very detailed, all that. You get in the 30,000 foot view. But um, that's, that's what we did. We have just about 10 minutes left. So I want to, and while, while I answer questions, can you throw that number back up? Because some people walked in late. So if you walked in later, uh, we want to give you all of the resources that we did through this 24 months. All of our artwork, all of our files, all of our teaching series, every email we sent out, every letter we sent out, that video that you watched, um, all of that, we want to just give it to you. Hope it adds value. You can take it. You can edit it. You can steal the language. You can say this is crap and never look at it. I don't care. But we just we just want you to have it. So just text or rise shine to, uh, with no space to 97000, and we'll give it all to you. You can have it all. Uh, yeah, any questions about our, yeah. Okay. Went up. Right. So, for those of you watching online, I've been told to repeat your question. So, tell me if I get this right. So, you're growing, you're leasing right now. So, but you need to have a solution, and uh, but you're not sure that if it's actually logistical right now because of all the prices and increased and. Um, what, and you're asking me what, what to do. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> he's right though. My, uh, two of my boys work in construction and they told me that a eight foot pine two by four is over $10 now. I'm like, whoa. Um, you know, so in terms of stress point, it sounds like that resonated with you. Like, yeah, we have all those stress points. So I'll share what we did, and maybe this will help you. Because you just, at the end of the day, you need a word from God. You just need the Holy Spirit to say, do this. And I'll share a couple. So we didn't know. I didn't want to build because we were only on three acres. I couldn't really see how we could stretch that three acres to grow until we got an, an architect. But I still wasn't convinced it was the right thing for us. So, and I knew building was going to be expensive. And, and steel had went up in our... What we thought was going to be one eight ended up being two eight, so it ended up being you know a million more than what we thought. But I'll tell you this: if you get a word from God, He's going to provide, and that was what happened to us. Like, and and honestly, I'm a worrier. Like, if just in transparency, like in in the stressing moments, I worry. Like, how's this going to happen? God always, always delivered. But before we knew. What we ended up doing is I was asking the Lord, it was during our 21 days of prayer and fasting at the beginning of the year, and I'm in the sanctuary, and the staff is praying, and I'm, we're looking at other buildings. So your op, you know your options, right? Your options are just keep doing what you're doing, and it sounds like that's not going to work. So it, yeah, it, oh, okay, it goes up. Yep, so it's a financial stress point, so that might not be the best solution. Uh, it could be, so keep doing what you're doing, find another location, or purchase some property and build. So what I was seriously kicking around was I am going to try to find another location and just have multiple locations. And I'm praying about it. And, we're in our seek, and I heard the Lord say, you're not done here yet. So I knew, so I heard that. So I thought, okay, so we're going to stay here. But how about the other locations? And I was in San Francisco with Pastor Lee, and I'm like processing this with him. And like, I don't know if I build or if we just add locations. I don't know what to do. And he said, it was like the Lord spoke through him. He said, it's both. You're going to build and you're going to have multiple locations. So I don't know if he was prophetic in the moment, but the next step for us was build. So you really, at the end of the day, you need a word from the Lord. I mean, I am not the best analysis guy to help you determine that. But you know your stress points, and you can lay out, you know, you're going to come to three or four options, right? 
Yep. And the Lord's going to tell you. But you know what? It would be a, a faith stretch for your church if, if you do get a word from the Lord and say, hey, we know it's expensive right now, but this is what God said. Because to God, whether it's 300,000, 3 million, or 30 million, or 3 cents, and it doesn't matter, he can provide, and he does. So, yeah, any other questions? This is a great question. Yes? Uh, how did you, I mean, my parents, um, my parents have definitely been active. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the house. building looks great, by the way. Yeah. I was living in the house while they were doing it, but just the weight and stress. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. So the question is, how, how as a pastor, as a lead pastor, did you handle the weight and the stress of that? Um, I thought that was one of the most stressful seasons for, for me, and it really was. And you probably sensed that on your, your, your parents as they built, too. Um, we got into our building in July of 2019. So we were in it just six, seven months, and then COVID happened. Then 2020 was like, oh, wait, this is more stressful. Uh, and uh, I'm not ashamed of this, but, you know, I, I prayed a, a ton, and there was a lot of going before the Lord. And I hope not all my answers are going to be pray, but I, I did pray a lot. And honestly, I got a life coach. Like some, I talked to another pastor at a couple thousand people. They're, you know, way ahead of us. And I said, hey, what do I not know? And he says, what you don't know is the stress that you're going to go under. You need someone to process with. So I found a Christian life coach that I meet with every other week. And, uh, and it's really good. Uh, I'm not a cusser, but I could cuss at him and he wouldn't care. Like, I just want to tell you how mad I am or, or, or celebrate with him. I processed verbally with someone outside of the church. Um, I did have a couple of breakdown intense moments. Uh, and there's a couple of times, honestly, just in my flesh, I had to circle back and apologize to people. When the builder who goes to our church was behind schedule, that's a tough conversation to have. Anyway, just to have that conversation with someone in your church or as a builder, not in your church would be hard, but now they're also a congregant who's also giving to the project, and you have to have that like, come on, let's get this together, let's keep moving. Uh, so I did have to circle back to him, but it was, it was a lot, but the Lord was faithful, honestly. I sensed the grace of God. Um, I, you know, handling the litigation stuff, I needed words from God, and, and I, you know, am I going to go to court is the word, and he's like, no, let them have it. Let them have it and then pay them uh, was a rough thing, but it was the leading of the Holy Spirit. But processing, we're not meant to do it alone. I process, and I still have that life coach. I'm like, hey, you helped me through this. Now well, let's go through COVID together. And he's like, okay, let's do that too. <laughs> yep. And honestly, I had Pastor Lee. I had close friends. So your network, um, someone close that you can process with is healthy yeah any other questions awesome well let me oh we're i'm over schedule let me just say a quick prayer and then we're done father lord i don't know what's in the room today but i know destiny's in the room i know calling is in the room and i know that there are cities represented in this room and there are lost people that need to know jesus so I pray for every woman and every man of God that's sitting in this room that's called by you to reach their city, maybe to build, Father, maybe to purchase something. Lord, you meet all of our needs. Lord, and you give us vision, Father. And if you give the vision, you're going to provide for it. And so I pray against any spirit of fear that says it's the wrong timing. Lord, I'm reminded of your word in Genesis that talks about the, the ancient man, Lord, who sowed in the time of famine. Father, so we will not look at the externals. We will look to the heart of God as our source and our guide. And I pray, Father, for an increase of your voice. I pray for an increase of vision to be released in hearts, to believe you for the next thing, to, to believe you for the next step. 
um, whether that's to build, whether that's to stay, whether that's to find a different location. Holy Spirit, speak to uh, the men and women in this room, Father. I pray for their congregations. I ask, Lord, they would be filled with life. I pray that the joy of the Lord would be there, Father. Give every pastor and every pastor's wife that's in the room today, Father, the source and the strength they need to lead the church in this next era that we are entering as a, as a church and as a nation, Father. They need your wisdom. Father, give us uh, the mindset to understand the times and to navigate what we're going through, Father, so that vision keeps moving forward because vision still is strong. No matter what's going on in the world, the kingdom of God must go forward and must happen. And so I pray that for uh, the men and women in this room, Father, called by you, that they carry the kingdom cause that you put in their heart, the burdens you placed on them, Father, that you would walk it out with them, Father, and fulfill the things you've called them to do in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.